Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my special guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Every once in a while, a rare individual comes along to leave a meaningful mark on his chosen profession. Lee Allen is such a person. So begins an article entitled, Lee Allen, the Man and the Legend, in the Journal of Ophthalmic Photography. Lee Allen, a native Iowan, worked in the University of Iowa Department of Ophthalmology from 1937 until his retirement in 1976. Early in his life, his first love was painting. He studied art at the Cummings School of Fine Arts in Des Moines, the University of Iowa, and was assistant to artist Grant Wood in the mid-30s. Hired as a medical illustrator in 1937, he expanded into many other areas. He was a pioneer in the area of photography for eyes, developing several techniques and devices in the field, such as stereoscopic drawings and fundus photography. He did basic research and built teaching models. In the area of prosthetics, or artificial eyes, Lee Allen designed the first ever plastic eye, uniquely shaped to fit each patient. He helped develop an implant that surgeons could use to make an artificial eye move in sync with the real eye. His work resulted in the co-authorship of four books and 54 published papers and journals. Since his official retirement, Lee Allen continues to work at the Iowa Eye Prosthetics in Coralville, producing custom-made plastic artificial eyes. And perhaps most importantly, he's returned to his first love, painting. His painting have been featured, excuse me, his paintings have been featured in many shows. Welcome, Lee, to One of a Kind. I appreciate you coming today. And I know you were born in Muscatine in 1910. How did you get from Muscatine to Des Moines? What took you there? Long story. I'd love to hear it. Well, <clears throat> My father was working in Muscatine, and when the second, the first World War got started, he went to the Rock Island Arsenal to work. So we moved to Davenport first. Mm -hmm. My mother died during the period of the, the bad German flu, mm -hmm. and uh, my father went looking for his, for her best friend. And so he, he married my mother's best, best friend. My stepmother then, who was working in, in Des Moines, talked my father into going into to Des Moines. Mm -hmm. Now, it, when you were young, about 11, you received a very special gift from your father. A set of paints, oil paints, mm -hmm. in a box, wooden box. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I immediately started copying things out of magazines and then eventually began to paint things I knew. Did you think that this was going to be your life's work as being an artist? I think that, I think I really did from that time on. Mm -hmm. it, it impressed me so. Then uh, I would go to the city library to get books. I loved history. Mm -hmm. So I'd be down there two or three times a week they had a, a gallery on the second floor of the city library. They had exhibits by very outstanding people, mm -hmm. some European, some Americans. And uh, among others, I saw paintings of clouds by Marvin Cohn, mm -hmm. which impressed me tremendously. So with all that, I, I began to get even more interested in painting. So while I was in high school, I uh, registered in the fine arts side. They, uh, in Des Moines, the coming uh, school? Was no, this, or was this, this was high school. This was high school. And uh, as a matter of fact, I give 
my high school instructor credit for a lot of the things that I've done because she encouraged me. Now, your father did not want you to be an artist, is that right? Definitely. <laughs> I mean, he was yes. kind of adamant about that. That's right. He wanted you to do something a bit more practical, like engineering. Yeah, he was an engineer, mm -hmm. and he thought I should follow him. But it didn't appeal to me. <laughs> I, I must say, I learned how to use a few tools mm -hmm. from him, so, so that later, while I was in the eye department, I could make things, mm -hmm. such as the implants. Um, but I, I was so impressed with the art that I just stayed with it. So how, how did your, where did your association with Grant Wood and how did you get painting those wonderful murals that um, are in many towns across the state, Ames, Emmitsburg, Ottawa? Well, among, among other things, my, my instructor, Harriet Macy, encouraged me in oil painting. So I continued to do sketches outside, and in uh, 1928, I painted a picture of a neighbor's backyard with the sun setting behind a group of trees, and exhibited that at the Iowa State Fair's Art Salon. Mm -hmm. And I took second prize with that. and. Uh, I'm not sure I got that right. No, I didn't do that. The thing that I submitted was a, a, an etching. To the state fair? Yes. And I won first prize with that etching. And when I was going around looking at the other things, I met Grant Wood. I was introduced to Grant Wood. And uh, we got along quite well. He had taken first prize in oil painting and sweepstakes of the show. So in the, in the next year, I submitted a oil painting, that this oil painting I was speak, speaking of, and I took first prize in oil painting and Grant took sweepstakes. And we met again there and talked at great length. And I, I told him I was coming down to Iowa City to go to school. He said, why, why don't you come up and enter this night class we have in sketching mm -hmm. class? And I said, well, that's a good idea. So after I was settled here, found out where the class was, I got on the interurban in the evening. You remember there was an interurban <laughs> back in those days. Mm -hmm. Went to Cedar Rapids attended this class and then got back on the interurban and came back to Iowa City. So I kept up a relationship with him and met a lot of other, other people that I saw later in life too. And uh, to tell you how I got, really got in to working with Grant Wood, I went into the, the World's Fair, the Chicago World's Fair, in 1933, I believe it was. And when I got home, I found a note stuck my, to my door in the rooming house. And it said, I've just ma been made director of the Midwest section of the WPA, WPA art project, uh -huh. and would you like to work with me? I wish I'd saved that, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say I didn't save a lot of things I should have, but of course I accepted. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that became the murals you right. painted in Ames? There's one at Iowa. We didn't paint them in Ames. Oh, you didn't paint? Where did you paint them? Well, you should know the history of Iowa City. <laughs> Grant didn't have any place. He had this project in mind to do the murals for the Ames Library, mm -hmm. but there were very tall panels, and there's no place to put a tall panel like that, not ordinarily. But he discovered that there was a swimming pool on the north end of the women's gym. At that time, it was old, the old women's gym, that it was not being used anymore. 
And so he arranged to have a new floor put in because the floor of the swimming pool sloped. They built a wooden, wooden floor and uh, then put the, the uh, frames, the framework up for the panels and they had a great deal, a great deal of distance and height yeah. that, we could, that we could take advantage of. So he brought the mural project down to Iowa City. And you painted him? And, and I was already here. It was very easy. <laughs> so after they were completed, then they were shipped to Ames and put in the and library put there. A, put on the wall with the, an adhesive. Now you painted one on soil conservation for the post office in Ottawa. Did you do that there? I did, did the one for Ottawa here. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> that was in 1936, I believe. And uh, there, there's, at this period, the federal, uh, what is it called? Justice Department, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That had the money and wanted to put, uh, somebody in the government anyway got funds to put uh, mural paintings in the new post offices that we're building over in, around the country, small, smaller cities. And they announced that they would have contests. The artists could submit sketches and describe what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of that group that were submitted, they'd choose what they thought was the best and uh, give the man a commission. Mm -hmm. So I did this for the Ottawa Post Office and won the commission. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I saw a small picture of it, and it's 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 quite lovely. And uh, then I saw a small picture of the one from the Emmitsburg yeah. Post Office, and that's on wildlife conservation. Right, that's right. Um, so at this time, Lee, in your story, you had a were starting to have a family, and uh, you got a call from the University of Iowa ophthalmology department and said, "Would you like a job as a medical illustrator?" Uh, uh, I met the girl on the street. Oh, tell me this the, story. The, the, <laughs> as I said, my friend and roommate, Gus, had left. And about six years later, I met this girl who was not then the, the medical illustrator in the department. Met her on the street. And she said, I'm going to get married. Do you want my job? So I went home and talked it over with my wife, and I took the job. I had the feeling that by that time, I had felt enough of the problems that fine artists mm -hmm. have in painting, uh, so that I thought a better place to be earning a living was in some pra practical area. Did you know anything about the eye before you started? Oh, yes. Oh, you did? I've always been fascinated with the eyes. Well, then it sounded like um, it was meant to be. This former <clears throat> medical illustrator, my friend, Gus Bethke, mm -hmm. we were rooming together at that time. And I'd go over to the eye department and watch him work. And mm. He taught me to, how it, he painted the pictures and taught me the use of the medical uh, instruments to look in the, the eye or on the eye. And so when this job was offered to me, it wasn't completely unknown to me. I, mm -hmm. I, had, I knew what it was going to be like. And you were telling me before the interview began that you started out with a small, little brownie camera. That's when you... Well, when the first thing, uh, this, in 1937, there was no color photography. Mm -hmm. And the reason they wanted artists, they, ophthalmology isn't any good with it, without color. They distinguish various conditions mm -hmm. with changes in color of the various parts of the eye. And so <clears throat> black and white photography was not good enough for them. But an artist could look in, do a sketch, and then go off and 
finish it up in color, mm -hmm. come back and check it, go back and work again. And you can make a very realistic representation of the eye, either the outside or the inside. M most of the demand was for f photography of the fundus. That's the back of the eye where the retina, mm -hmm. the retina with the uh, nerve endings, rods and cones are located. And, uh, well, you, you had so many areas in the eye department that you touched. I mean, it was the medical illustration, it was uh, fundus photography, it was stereoscopic illustration. Who, were you self-taught? Did you self-teach yourself all this, Lee? Oh, the, some. Uh -huh. It's easy to skip over, and I'll, so I'll skip over and tell you this a little anecdote. I'd been doing drawings in the department for several years now, and uh, three years, and Dr. P.J. Leinfelder, mm -hmm. you may I remember the name, remember. yes. He stepped up into the doorway of my room one day and just said, can you do a stereoscopic drawing of a brain? And I said, yes. I, I didn't know whether it could or not, but I thought it it struck me as immediately as a, mm -hmm. an interesting project. So he pre prepared the uh, material we used, which were sections of a fixed a brain had been fixed and the tissue was fixed. And uh, he, he made the sections. And they, I translated these sections into sheets of transparent plastic. Mm -hmm. and spaced them properly, and then d did stereoscopic drawings of that. Then, by a, a long process, it ended up, we, we could see the outlines of the various features inside the brain. You could look through the brain and see these various features. Mm. We uh, mounted these up in, in a in frames and took them to an AMA, mm -hmm. American Medical right. Association meeting in New York, and let people see them in stereo. Were they stunned? Were they surprised? Was yes, this the very much. What imagine? They, they were used by quite a few people, mm -hmm. uh, and they still are. The drawings are over in the museum and the in the in medical the museum at the yeah. hospital. You know, I was talking to a gentleman in the eye department and saying in my research of, about you that there was just so much and it was so technical, all the things that you touched. And I said, of all the things that uh, Mr. Allen was involved with and developed and created and invented, what was the one thing maybe that touched the most lives? Uh, or, and uh, he thought maybe gonoscopy. And tell us what gonoscopy is. I know it, has to, it, it influences the treatment of glaucoma. Gonio refers to an angle, and it's the angle between the iris and the cornea. Mm -hmm. The space in there is filled with aqueous water. So, and back in that corner is a tissue that's like a sponge. Aqueous is being made back of the iris, comes out through the pupil, mm -hmm. makes its way into this anterior chamber, and back into the angle of the anterior chamber and goes back into the bloodstream through those porous, the porous tissue. So the study of the angle of the uh, anterior chamber mm -hmm. is very important to glaucoma. That's the place a lot of the glaucomas, at least, are caused mm -hmm. by a blockage of the outflow of the aqueous. And that can be for, for various things. It can get plugged up with uh, debris from uh, a de diseased iris, or it can be uh, for closed by contact of the iris with the cornea and having it stick there so that the aqueous can't get out to that sponge tissue. So the, there are various conditions and 
what I did was I illustrate as uh, many of those as c I could. Mm -hmm. I would actually take a patient, put him in, uh, in front of the slit lamp, and uh, do a sketch. The, you have to have a special prism to, to look through. So I'd do a sketch through that and take it to my room and work it up and finally come back and look again. The patient was usually there all day. And mm -hmm. I, then I would go back and finish it up. And also you worked with prosthetics, with artificial eyes, and it, it must have been so gratifying to f help someone oh, yeah. find an eye that fits, that feels good, and that right. perhaps looks pretty good. That's right. And uh, that must have given you a great deal of satisfaction. Well, that's an immediate mm -hmm. thing. You know, you can see it. When you're doing a drawing of chamber angle, you has to have to hope that they'll keep the drawing or m duplicate it, and other people will see it and make use of it. But we, when you have a patient that needs an artificial eye, that's immediately mm -hmm. uh, applicable, uh, applicable to problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, interestingly enough, this James Allen that started this on uh, gonioscopy, I didn't tell you about that, but he actually, uh, in I think it was 1938, he went to the uh, Columbia University Medical School and studied gonioscopy with the man, the only man that was doing a, much of, a, of it at that time. The instruments were very crude, and they put an instrument on the eye and take a look, and the water would all run out from under it, and it, they had to fill it again and put it back on the eye. And uh, so he came back with a very pessimic, pessimistic report of the value of gonioscopy. Mm -hmm. Well, when he t said the water was running out, I wondered why not eliminate most of the water. And so I made a prism that sat r right on the cornea, didn't need a quantity of water, just a capillary film. Mm -hmm. And uh, that w uh, I reported that in the magazine called Science in 1941. Mm -hmm. And uh, at about the same time, a man in Switzerland by the name of Goldman came up with another instrument, did the same thing, mm -hmm. but uh, in, in a different way. Well, your career is so full. You saw so many department chairs heading up the Department of Ophthalmology, and the Department of Ophthalmology has a worldwide reputation. Was it hard to leave in the uh, when you decided to step down and? Uh, you know, start a business in Coralville of prosthetics and get back to no, your painting? No, it wasn't difficult be, because I had taught enough people to do all of the things that I did that I didn't worry about it. The only thing that I felt badly about was that uh, my gonioscopic drawings had never been published in a book. And I, I was a little unhappy about that, but I took all the drawings with me. Oh. I didn't leave them there because knowing the way departments are, mm -hmm. they could have just as well have thrown, mm -hmm. thrown them away. So you have them now? Well, I, they're being made into a book. Good, good. Uh, Dr. Lee Allward over in the de department is the head of the glaucoma service. And so I talked to him and he's picked it up and it's, it's about to be printed. Great. Well, you know, you've made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Who, looking back in your life, was it that high school teacher that encouraged you in art, or who made a difference in your life? Well, I, th I think I'd, I, I wouldn't want to pick, <laughs> pick, you want to pick one, one mm -hmm. because so many people had so, many, so much influence on, on me. I, you said something about you were going to ask me this question, so I thought about it last night. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I came up with the fact that one of the people that influenced me was my father. Another person that influenced me was my stepmother, mm -hmm. almost more than my father. Because she encouraged you, didn't she? She, she encouraged me, and my father <laughs> discouraged me. <laughs> yeah, right. but, she believed in you. She must have uh, seen something exactly. in but you. But what my father did is very interesting. First of all, he went on only through the eighth grade in school. Mm -hmm. And then he took a job in the railroad roundhouse in, in Old Wine, Iowa. He lived in Hazleton, it was just walk, walking distance. And he'd work all day, and then he went, went to the library and studied on his own. Mm. He taught himself calculus, as a matter of fact. And he designed many very interesting and profitable machines and so forth. And so he thought a, a person didn't have to go to college. They didn't even have to go to high school. He was all for my taking Quitting. a job, working in a shop, and learning how to do things in the shop. So he would he would have been all right if you'd quit high school. Oh yes. He, as a matter of fact, he wouldn't let, let me let me stay at home. My in stepmother high talked him into letting me stay at home, but on the condition that I had to in the winter, take care of the furnace completely, banking it, cleaning out of the clinkers and the mm -hmm. ashes, banking it again, and so forth. Then after I've done that in the morning, I cooked breakfast for them for four years. And uh, then when it snowed, I had to clean it. I had to clear the snow. I mowed the lawn. Mm -hmm. I took the storm windows off and washed mm -hmm. them and washed the windows put them on, took them went off, and put the screens on. I had to do everything like that just to earn my keep. keep. And I, I had to buy my evening meal. He taught you to work so, hard, and you've right. always and worked I, hard. I don't, mind, I don't resent it at all. Well, I think you, it was good for me. And I want to talk uh, in the few minutes we have left about what you're doing now. I know you love, you're back to your first love of painting. And you brought in some wonderful pieces of yours, the, the large mural, uh, long mural of the students that you saw walking across, is it the Pentecrest? And then there's this wonderful piece that you started in the 50s, and uh, you said that in it is your philosophy of life. Would you explain it? Because the camera will shoot the picture of the upside down Santa Claus. Okay. To, to explain that. Well, the, that was the year that Sputnik went up, and I think November. And it's a new thing, easily remembered. Mm -hmm. And when I was preparing to do a blackboard drawing for a Christmas party, that came to my mind immediately. I should do something re regarding outer space. But I have a feeling, and I had a feeling then, that everything that man touches, man destroys. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I've said many, many times. It's a little extreme, mm -hmm. but it's true. Everything that man touches, he destroys eventually. And it seemed to me that putting all the emphasis on the science and uh, the physics of it and mechanics of getting something out into space and so forth. The, the romance that, that that created, and you see it now, mm -hmm. they still want to put a spaceship up as a space station. And uh, I think it's ridiculous, personally. Mm -hmm. So in regard to that drawing or the, that painting, my feeling is that Santa Claus is out there, out of his his environment. And he doesn't have any gravity to help him, and you can see that everything is blowing apart. Mm -hmm. It's a, the, the basic composition is an exploding composition. Not very many people do that sort of thing, and I think for that, for many reasons, the painting it really isn't understood. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you gave the original to the University of Iowa Art yes. Museum, and it's been hung down at uh, the First National Bank, you said, uh, for Christmas. And mm -hmm. uh, so the art museum, we will get to see it again if people haven't been able to see it. I hope all, so. Yes. They, so what are you working on now? What are you painting? Well, right now I'm, I'm doing a uh, commission. Of? Of a person's birthplace. <laughs> And it's giving, a, giving me a bit of a psychological problem. <laughs> yes, yes. I'd, I'd much rather do the things that I want to do. Mm -hmm. That come out of your... I, I painted s several portraits as commissions mm -hmm. and uh, did some bronze plaques of portraits of people in the eye department. Those are commissions, but... Uh, do you enjoy having your things in a show, or is that... Oh, yeah. Is that you, in Chicago, you had been in a show, and uh, up northern Iowa, and and here, and you even had a drawing. Was it a drawing in the Smithsonian uh, yeah. exhibit? Well, it's a <coughs> one of the preliminary sketches. It's, uh, I suppose about fifteen or eighteen inches long, mm -hmm. of the same subject that was put on the wall. That was the thing I submitted. Mm. To, for, to be judged and hopefully to get a commission. They've kept it. They've kept a lot of them. Uh, they had a, an exhibit, a traveling exhibit made of all of those things, and it came to Davenport two years ago. Mm. Yeah. But that's kind of the area where you began, Muscatine, Davenport? Well, your... I lived there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, Lee, I, our time has run out, and I, you, you have a, such a full story that uh, it's uh, quite remarkable. We need probably three or four more hours, but at least people will get a touch and a hint of what you've been about all these years in Iowa City and in Iowa, and it's, it's been a privilege. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. My Enjoy. guest has been Lee Allen, medical illustrator, artist, inventor, and developer. In an earlier career as an artist, Lee was a friend and student of Grant Wood. Many public murals in Iowa were done by Lee. I quote from a tribute to him published in the Journal of Ophthalmic Photography, quote, through sheer determination, perseverance, and a dedication to excellence, he not only has mastered ophthalmic illustration, photography, and ocular prosthetics, that has also contributed meaningful advancements in each of these fields. These achievements notwithstanding, his most profound contribution has been his abiding commitment to helping others learn and improve their craft. Lee embodies the true spirit of the dedicated investigator. And as the late Dr. Alson Braley said, you can't imagine how good he was. He touched so many people's lives every day. Lee Allen, one of a kind.